Hi, I'm Mike Shires, and I'd like to welcome you this afternoon. Uh, this is part of the ongoing series at Pepperdine where faculty are kind of sharing some of the things we're doing in our classrooms. Uh, my talk today, I've tried to design in a way that doesn't duplicate things that have already been done on campus, uh, to talk about some of the things that I'm doing differently or that I'm hoping to do differently in the fall now that we've worked out the bugs in the spring. And so this is a real work in progress. I want to encourage questions as we go along. And also, if there's things that I say that don't make sense, feel free to raise your hand and, and kind of see clarification. Uh, the talk I'm going to give today is going to focus on using sort of two sets of technology that I've really been spending some time with in the public policy program. And what we are looking at in these two technologies are the use of clickers, these little student response cards, they call them. You'll see SRS all over the place. It's these little real-time devices that let you push a button, and the professor actually sees the feedback immediately. And in fact, you can put the feedback up on the screen and share it with the audience. Uh, the other thing that we're going to talk about, and this is kind of an exciting development, and it's all on my computer here, we'll see in a few seconds, is Pepperdine has developed the ability to use uh, class-level authentication in iTunes University. And what that means is we can put up content on iTunes University with all the benefits of iTunes University. Specifically, almost any device can access it. Uh, it's almost universally accessible in terms of where you are. And, but at the same time, we can restrict that content to only people who are in a specific class or who are members of the Pepperdine University com community. And that's a very powerful resource because what it does is it opens the door to use that technology in the classroom. And I'm kind of excited about it because I do a lot of presentations in my classroom and it really allows me to get the students involved with it. So the title of today's talk is Using Technology to Put Students at the Center of Learning. And I'm going to explain a little bit more what I mean by that. But the idea is that instead of focusing on the professor and their expertise or focusing on the material and the mysteries thereof, it really focuses on making the students' abilities and interaction with all of the above the focus of the education conversation. So to start off, I want to put this in a little bit of context. When we talk about technology and education, there's kind of four categories of things. There's three that are talked about a lot. And then there's this fourth one that I'm going to talk about today. The first is putting content in multiple modes, and I'll show some, uh, I'll talk about that in a second. The second is engaging students by expanding the interaction outside the classroom or outside the face-to-face -face time or even online time and having what they call asynchronous conversations. Uh, the third has to do with assessment and reinforcing lessons. This idea that I'm going to have a lesson plan that has objectives, I'm going to have a pretest and a post-test and see how well students learn. And then this fourth one, which I'm going to call centering students in the learning process. And I haven't seen a lot about this in the literature, but this is kind of the philosophy that I've adapted in my class. So let me talk a little bit first about this idea of, technology, uh, of multiple modes. If you think of courses at Pepperdine, our Sakai application, we can put up video, we can put up audio, we can put up uh, images, we can put up documents, we can, uh, we can put almost anything that we want up there. And it's really a warehouse. It's a place where we park the stuff. We say, students, go check in at dock number 17 in the warehouse. The second approach, and this is the iTunes world. iTunes University has lectures from professors all over the world. It has a lot of content from the participating institutions where you can go. I listened to a great lecture by one of the eminent scholars in evolution. And I, I got to listen to nine hours of him speaking on the topic, which for me at least was fun. Uh, some of the content is student generated. Uh, YouTube is the great location for this. You'll find lots and lots of student and externally generated content. Some of those things are relevant to your classes. My public finance class, we did a great thing on the national debt that was just this cute little YouTube video that we used. And so that's another aspect of trying to get information in multiple modes. Sometimes it's bringing people who can't physically be here to this place. At the School of Public Policy, we had a class last semester where we had guests from all over the country come in on, a, on the screen here and show up larger than life, literally and have a conversation with the students, and it was a two-directional conversation. Uh, there are other settings like Illuminate, and I, I've experimented a little with this, where you have essentially an online classroom. I, I, I did one lecture on strategic planning one time where I had a student at the coffee shop at Disneyland. Not sure how focused she was, but it was this idea of being able to bring people into a place when there's, con when there's conflicts in the schedule. And then finally, there's this idea of asynchronous content. And this is the idea of blogs, RSS feeds, places where people are out there selectively picking up lots of information and streamlining it for the students for access. 
So one thing is just bringing information to the classroom. The second aspect is how you engage conversation. All conversation doesn't have to be face to face. There are great conversations face to face. The last semester, for example, one of the assignments I gave my students was to post on a forum, how, when is it okay to take a human life? And they were limited, there was a limited number of words and they were required to post their argument for when it was okay and then to participate in a dialogue on at least three other entries on what other people said. And what it did was when we came into the classroom to have that conversation, the seeds were already planted. They'd already engaged not only their own ideas, but the ideas of other people. And so you can have these asynchronous conversations. Blogs are another form of that. They tend not to be as interactive. It tends to be me telling you what I think about the world today, kind of like a Facebook feed or something like that. Um, there's Facebook and social networks. There's also the idea of using games online and structured debates online to sequence a conversation over time. Uh, and then finally, there's this idea of having groups, just creating meeting places for students to come together to talk about issues. The social networks are really big on this in terms of Facebook, uh, Yahoo groups, Google has a version of it as well. And so this is the idea of kind of broadening the location of conversation, if you will, and the opportunity to have it. The third role is the idea of enforcing assessment, of approving how students process information. And if you didn't see Greg McNeil's presentation last fall at the Faculty Technology Conference, you need to go onto the Pepperdine Community webpage and find it and see it. Because what he does is he uses these student response uh, devices in his law class, is the example he did at the conference, and actually shows how he has a learning objective. He pre-tests, he sees what the student's level of understanding is before, they go through the course material, and then at the end of it, he does a post-test to see how well they mastered the idea. And they give them hypothetical problems and they have to provide a response. And that's the most commonly viewed role for these response devices. What I'm going to talk about with respect to these today actually goes a bit beyond that aspect of the conversation. But this is one of the really valuable roles for these in, in terms of teaching. And so those are the things that, we, that at least I, I tended to think about in terms of the use of technology in education. And then I got involved in sort of applying these two technologies into a class that I teach at the School of Public Policy called Political, Organizational, and Strategic Aspects of Public Policy Analysis. And I have three goals in the class. One is to teach students the policy analytic framework and how to apply it. The second is for them to become more competent public speakers. And the third is for them to hone their rhetorical skills. How do you dissect an argument? How do you understand the structure of somebody else's argument? And how do you respond to that? Or how do you build your own arguments that will stand up under their review? And so it's a, it's, a, it's a class that's really focused on cognitive processes as opposed to memorizing or playing games. We use the case method a lot in it. But in the course of doing this, I discovered this idea that in fact technology can be used to focus the educational experience on the student. Because what I found myself doing was spending less time worrying about the details of which direction their argument was, go, was going, and especially in public policy, which is all about trade-offs, there rarely is the perfect answer that's obviously right to everybody on earth. Every public policy choice comes with a series of trade-offs. And so you have to weigh those. And so what I found was what I was more focused on was the student's cognitive and analytic processes than the actual, our recommendation is to you know, privatize the airport, for, in, for example, in one of the cases we did. And it was really how you get to that point that was the focal point of the class's educational experience. And that got me to thinking more and more about how we engage students in the classroom. And so one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is how technology can bridge the information that's going on in the conversation before us with what they're learning outside the classroom. Public policy depends on a lot of disciplines for its components and how well they can integrate those is one of the challenges they face. The second thing is how technology can be used to stimulate those discussions and to guide them down productive paths. And so what I'm going to talk about is this idea of student-centered learning. And the first aspect of it, if we go back to sort of the traditional, I have a reminder popping up here. If we go back to the traditional model of teaching and education, it was very much the expert speaking to the student and the knowledge they're imparting in kind of a, unidire a unidirectional process. It's, it's water flowing downhill. And hopefully enough of it sticks in the student's brain that they're smarter after the semester than when they started. And it's a fantastic model for the lecture format. In fact, it's the, the foundations of sort of the expert novice kind of uh, what I call here the disciple-based teaching, 
where you're trying to lead somebody who's new to it to a new topic. And then education discovered the community-based model. And this is almost the embodiment of the Socratic, oh, in, in this model, technology, oh, that's interesting. You can't see my little computer here. There's a little computer here. Uh, it's actually a projector. It's an overhead projector. Technology is used typically in this setting to amplify the voice of the expert. It's designed to give them a fancier cave wall, if you will, to write on, or to be able to use other types of content besides just written content. And so then the Socratic method said, let's sit around and pursue truth together. Let's have a series of conversations. And in fact, in the social sciences, the lens model and some of the community-based models where we all sit around and we pursue truth as fellow sojourners. And in this model, the little computers are here and here this time, you see technology equipping everybody and everybody applying it in their own way to the problem at hand, but it's a very community-based kind of conversation where we're seeking things and we're exploring ideas together. And then the model that I'm gonna talk about today actually takes all these things, here's our little computer again since it's hiding, uh, takes all these things and instead of focusing it on the material, focuses it on the student and on their learning processes. Now I understand the material is often the purpose of education, but one of the biggest challenges we have in modern American education is that students can't think critically. They can't figure out the structure of an argument. They can't go through the process of learning and knowledge effectively. And so that's what this kind of exercise is really targeted at. And so what I want to do today is kind of talk about how I'm using clickers to do some of these things, to, to put the student at the center of the learning enterprise, how iTunes University, I believe, will be a tool to do that. Now let me just put a footnote on all this. We just got it up in the last couple of weeks with the course-based authentication. And so there's still a few bugs to work out, and I think we're going to come across one today, unfortunately, but you'll at least get the gist of what I'm talking about and what I'm hoping we can do in the spring, or I mean in the fall. And then some of the takeaways. Having used these things, there's some lessons that I've learned that hopefully will be useful for people who are thinking about exploring these, these approaches as well. So first, let's talk about clickers. As I said, you have in a clicker system, students have a response device. And one of the nifty things that's happened is they can actually use their Android or iOS phone or uh, pad or touch as response devices. There are a little hic couple little hiccups I can I'll talk about later with these. The, the biggest one is that the software you log in on likes to log out after about 10 minutes. So they kind of have to use it every 10 minutes, which if you think about how you're designing your class means you have to have an interaction. I'm hoping that's a bug that we can work a way around, but it made it a little frustrating to use these last time because everybody who had one of these was ready to go. Now, some schools buy these for their students. Uh, I actually consider it a textbook. They're about 30 bucks. And since I don't have a formal big textbook for my class, I have students buy these instead. Uh, and so there's this response card on the professor's computer, and I don't have it plugged in today because Greg did a great job demoing this and we don't have a lot of time. You plug in this device. This is the receiver device that talks to all these clicker cards. The I iOS devices and Black, uh, they're gonna have a Blackberry soon, but the iOS devices all talk through the web. But this actually talks to these physical cards. They're good for about 100 feet. So you've got pretty good range multiple channels if you have professors using them side by side. If you have a MacBook or a MacBook Air, you have to buy a USB hub that you can plug these things into for the simple reason that the cable for the monitor is right next to one of the USB ports and the power supply is next to the other one and these things are too wide. So there's one of those little practical tidbits. Anyway, the idea is students will get a question on the screen, they'll post their response by clicking the appropriate appropriate button on the pad, and after a fixed amount of time, and you actually see how many students have responded, you post what they, did, what they answered. So if there were four responses, in this case, the majority of them posted the fourth response. Uh, if you think about this as an assessment tool, it's fantastic. If you look here, here's an actual class lecture I did on strategic planning, or class session. The first four or five questions were this assessment model. It was questions like, you know, the summary of Mintzberg's arguments include these things, and which ones are not included. SWOT means what? Which you'd be surprised, a lot of students in public policy at least, that's a new concept. And you can see one, an example of what, the question, of what the question actually looks like the students see on the screen. They would then push their button for the right answer. And then I could not make the software do this because I didn't have a session going. It puts up that little bar chart. 
that shows what the answers are. And if you program it right, you'll see here one of these answers is in green. That's the right answer. And so poof, it shows up and tells you how many students got it right as well. This is a great tool when you're introducing new material to see what kind of mastery there was in the material and to sort of preface what you're doing in the conversation. I had a class on budgets where it was clear that people, uh, the students didn't understand one of the readings. So instead of engaging in a conversation about sort of what the implications of the reading were, we started off with a conversation about what the reading actually meant in the first place. And so it's a great diagnostic tool sometimes if there's just a disconnect between the student audience. Uh, sometimes there's a final on the wrong day or a midterm on the wrong day and students haven't done the readings. It gives you a great measure of that as well. But it's a great tool for that purpose. But what I use it for goes beyond that. If you look here in these questions, the first five or so are quiz questions. And then the rest of these questions are really designed to shape the conversation in my classroom. And there's three things that I'm trying to do with these questions. The first one is to foster a dialogue by creating what I call instantaneous communities. This idea that there are groups of students in the room who have a commonality or a distinction from other groups that we can allow them to identify with other students. The second thing that I want to do is I want to get a, a poll. I want to sense what the range of perspectives is. One of my colleagues at Berkeley complains there are no students to the right of center in his classroom at the Berkeley Policy School. And so he has to figure out how to have a conversation when in fact there's very little disagreement in the room. One of the really great things about Pepperdine, as we'll see in a second, is we have a very diverse student body. But that kind of information helps the professor know, is the reason there's not a dialogue because there's no disagreement, or is the reason we don't have a dialogue because people aren't participating? And there's two very different solutions to those problems. And then the third issue is how you take those perspectives and those ideas and you drag students down a path of cognitive analysis. You take students down a road where they think about what they're doing and what the next step in the argument is that they're trying to get to. So this first aspect, the idea of fostering dialogue by creating instantaneous communities, one of the easiest ways to do this is I actually polled our student body, now brace yourselves, about their political interests. Now one of the great things about this clicker system, I asked them what party they were or were they identified with. Now one of the great things about this, and you'll see this on the next slide, is you can have anonymous questions where the system doesn't track who says what. For a quiz, you want to know who got the right answer and who does. But for this, for this purpose, you put an anonymous question in, and it won't track what they're responding to. It won't say who responded to what. But what it does do is you look at the profile of the students, you see about a third of them are Republican, about a third of them are Democrat, or a fourth of them are Democrat, a fourth of them are some other party, and a fourth of them are from out of the country. That didn't add up right, but you get the idea. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. What that says is if I'm a student who's in the classroom, and my ideas are to the left of center or to the right of center, then I have classmates who are in the same place. And it allows them to create a bond. The idea of where you get your information from. People are behaving in different ways and tracking other information. It's just a great way of taking a group of people, in this case 50 students, in a classroom and having them kind of affiliate with each other and to make them more comfortable about having a conversation and about taking risks in that setting. And so that's, that's one of my favorite uses. The second involves polling how broad, this is that anonymous designation, by the way, so I put a big arrow here so we can see it. Um, polling students about what their range of perspectives is on an issue. Here's a question that might have some controversy. The US should take a leading role in resolving the European financial crisis. Okay, well, the first question is kind of designed to introduce the topic and to gauge the diversity of perspectives. I don't have the results up here. This one actually engendered a very bimodal response. Some felt strongly we should, some felt strongly we shouldn't. And there were several that said, I really have no opinion. But the idea was to gauge the breadth of the disagreement, but also to introduce the disagreement. There is a bimodal distribution on this perspective. Some think we should do a lot, some think we should do absolutely nothing, and they're passionate about those two positions. And typically, if you don't have one of those two positions, you're indifferent. And I don't mean that you don't, I mean that you don't have an opinion. You're really not engaged in the question. And so to take from that spot to then go to the next level and say, okay, and actually, here we go, here's that one. The US should take a more leading role. Okay, what other ways should government intervene in the distribution of wealth in societies, in the exercise of rights, 
an abuse of rights? How should we intervene in the private sector in terms of leadership and control? This was a class on strategic planning. The goal here wasn't to answer those questions. The goal here was to talk to students about how you devise a strategy to establish the right boundaries to do those things. What are the, what are the premises and the resources we need to involve in this process? Who are the people we need to involve in order to come to consensus on how we balance these competing interests? And so the use of clickers in this case you know, gives us these sort of three functionalities. The idea of surveying the students is also a great way, by the way, when you're, when you're having sort of faculty reviews and you want to talk about issues of diversity, uh, it's a great way to tap into what students' perspectives are on lots of issues and what their experiences are. I, I, one of the questions I pulled was your ethnic identity. And you can really collect data that tells you what the students are talking about with themselves as opposed to what forms they filled out in the past. So it's kind of, a, it's an interesting, I'm excited. This year was the first year I got to play with this in this class, but it was a great opportunity. And the students really responded to this. It was interesting because days that I didn't do these, uh, the discussion was much flatter, it was much slower. When we had these interactions, just the idea of in some way saying, what's your opinion on this issue and how does it interact with what's going on in this con broader conversation? Got students engaged very quickly. Now, there are some practical things that I will tell you. The technology is pretty good on these clickers. The responseware, that's the version that runs on the phones and stuff like that, has a couple little glitches like that 10 minute timeout thing. Uh, but beyond that, it works pretty well. There is some time involved in overhead. Uh, you have to set aside time to do the polls. You just finished a section on strategic planning. Now I gotta poll you guys and see if you learned anything. You have to carry that energy over during the polling process. And there's almost kind of a dead time where you can't deliver new content because the students are hopefully thinking about their responses to the polling. And so it, it, there's a dynamic that happens around that. Uh, some of the other things to think about, PowerPoint integration is solid for PCs if you have PowerPoint 2007, 2010. Again, look at, at Greg McNeil's presentation. You can do amazing things with it. The versions you saw here are the Mac version because right before I went to this technology, I switched over to a MacBook, and of course, it's not quite as integrated. PowerPoint 2004 is integrated fully. 2011 is not. And you can't go backwards if you have Lion. So if, you're, if you have 11, the turning point anywhere, as you saw, I was able to use it really well. It's very simple to use. The learning curve is very flat. It's not a complicated process. There are some time costs associated, especially if you use the response bear with identifying who, which student is which, because they have to map their login IDs to who they are so that you can use it for quizzes and things. And then the other challenge that you have is, in some ways, you need to rethink how you teach. You have to teach in modules if you want to use this pre-test and post-test kind of stuff. And for a lot of us who think all the information is so interrelated that it's hard to break things into pieces, you have to figure out how to do it in pieces, but then have that integration come through. And so, I mean, I think from a practical perspective, those were the biggest challenges I had. The second technology that I want to talk about is this idea of using iTunes University Access. Now, this is particularly useful for faculty who have student presentations in their classes. Um, I, I mean, if you think about it, in most classrooms, there's a limited number of ways that students and faculty interact. There's the faculty-led discussion, there's the lecture, which is usually fairly unidirectional, um, and then there's the essays they write, there's written feedback, but it's very hard to incorporate sort of oral interaction and to foster students' ability to think on their feet to express their ideas clearly and to build logic quickly in their heads, to build an argument for something quickly in their heads. And yet in a field like public policy especially, but I mean this is true in any, I think, of the social sciences especially, um, this idea of being able to bring that ambiguity together into an argument is one of the key skills that will distinguish the best students from the weakest students. And so what I've tried to do with the iTunes universe, what I hope to do, here's, here's the idea. The students will be doing presentations and we will be uploading that content to iTunes University, and then I have a diagram in a second that shows how we do all, how we use it in the classroom in a setting. But I put this up here first because this is the process that you go through to get the content from the student to, the, to iTunes University. And it's not a process without cost. The returns are really, really high. 
but it's not a process without cost. This idea that you have to capture there is just like we're recording this presentation, you have to capture it, then you have to convert it to the right digital format, and then you actually have to get it into iTunes U in the right place in a format that's accessible to students. They're not hard tasks to do, but there is a little bit of learning curve associated with this. The value is tremendous. Let me just switch over here and show you. Now, most of us, by the way, when we think of iTunes University, what's the first thing you think of? You think of a lecture that's been recorded and posted up there, just like today's session. And in fact, I did that. And I have on iTunes University here a sample from one of my class sections using our classroom. This is a, this is a monopoly problem in economics. And you can see here, I'm not saying. Most of the time we don't worry about competitive delivery, but we do worry about the cost of the students. We worry about United Airlines having, or Northwest. Ever been to Minneapolis? Have you ever been to Minneapolis? Not to bore you with the joys of monopolies, but the idea here is we have the whiteboard. This is the digital whiteboard. And we have here a video feed. If I'm doing something that's visual, students can see it. Um, and then you also have the audio track, which is separate. And by the way, that's one of the biggest challenges with this process. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again later. Make sure you record the audio and the video on the same device, if at all possible. Uh, synchronizing tracks has become, I, I've given up. And if you actually watch this carefully, you'd, you'd see it's about a second and a half off. Um, it, the, the technologies are different enough. But this is what most of us envision when we see it. And if we go back to the iTunes you, model here, you can see there's the class, there's, you know, there's a series of lectures you could have under it. But what I've tried to do with this process actually takes it a step further. And my goal is not this backup model, but it's actually to create content of the students doing these things that we're talking about, these cognitive processes, these discussion processes, and to make that a focal point of a conversation. So to do that, I've developed a, a series of tools. And the tools are over here, iTunes U content. And if you do a lot of this, you will have at some point your own backup video camera, your own cables, your own power scripts, and for those days when the sound system's not working, your own speakers. And you will put them in a backpack somewhere just in case things aren't working well that day. Uh, one of the challenges that this has is that there's a lot of technologies coming together in this process. Pepperdine is doing really well at bringing these things together and making them very accessible. Uh, but there is sort of this, what if one piece isn't working? And if one piece isn't, I have, a, I have a day's lecture with no audio track. And so it's valuable only if I want to voice over the track, which I haven't gotten excited about doing that lecture yet again. Uh, but what I do is I actually bring in my own camera and I videotape the presentations, and, and there's a reason for this I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And then we also record it for the iTunes U format. And you can actually use that same content, um, but you don't have to. The, some of the classrooms uh, are wired in a way that the capture equipment's already there, everything's in place, you just push the button, and it actually shows up in a section of iTunes. And you can just copy it straight over. It's really nice. Um, but one of the challenges that we have here is what I want to do is I want to put the student in the middle of the conversation, but I want to have their peers be part of the dialogue that focuses on their process. I want to be part of the dialogue. And then there's the formal, I have to give you a grade part of the dialogue. And so what happens is what I do is the students do a presentation. Each student in the class is handed a piece of paper that has the grading rubric for that assignment. And each student in the class during the presentation is actually assessing their classmate and explaining the argument that was laid before them and assessing its, assessing its effectiveness and where it failed. So while that's happening, and I would love, by the way, someday to have an iPad app that does all that and compiles all the data digitally, but right now uh, we're doing it the old-fashioned way with pen and paper. At the same time, I'm watching the student, I'm taking notes, I'm providing feedback that's going to feed this grading process, and I'm also anticipating the next part of the conversation. When the students are done presenting, we take my camera, plug it into the video system in the classroom, and this works in any classroom at Pepperdine. I've been doing this for years. And we watch their presentation. And we don't watch all of it usually. We watch parts of it. And we watch the parts that are most instructive. Where was the part the argument was strongest, where it was the weakest? And at the same time, we also reflect on the effectiveness of the student's speaking style. Now, there's all kinds of minds that can happen in the midst of this, and I'll talk about those in a second. 
Once that process is over, iTunes U will give us the ability to then take that content and put it into the class folder in iTunes so that students can go back and watch the presentations at their leisure. The thing I have found most effective in helping students be better speakers is having them see themselves speak uh, as much as they hate it. And everybody hates to see themselves speak. I'm pretty sure all of us hate our voices on the answering machine. Uh, but the reality is when you see what you do and how you do it, you interact with that and you change things. And so that's what I try and do with the students. That's one of the values of this. The second part is, and that's what I'm talking about when I say student self-evaluation here in real time. The second part is we only spend a little bit of time, I mean there's a finite amount of time in each class on that as a group. The students then have the opportunity to go home and watch what they did and follow the whole argument. And when they get their formal evaluation from me with their grade, and the assessment of what they did and where the argument worked and where it didn't work and what could be changed, I can point to specific timestamps in the presentation. And unlike other times, where well, what I've done in the past is I've burned DVDs of each presentation and given them to the students to do this. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to say, go to 232. This is where you talk about what options are available to the policymakers. Guess what? You didn't explain why those are the options. That's a problem because you're going to argue for one of those in a second. And so they're able to go back and see, oh yeah, I just said there's three options. I didn't say why these are the three options. And so it really becomes a very powerful tool to allow students to go back and focus. But notice, I have not yet said they got the wrong answer. This isn't about the content. This is about the processes the students are going through. There's some great implications of this. The idea of immediate feedback. Oh, by the way, the reason why I use the camera in the classroom, remember that part of the process that I talked about before called encoding? This takes a little while. The computer has to go through a 20 minute presentation with lots and lots of data and convert it into a digital format that you can move through. It takes it some time to do that. So that's why I use the live camera, at least in parallel. And so the advantages, you get this immediate response and feedback. We're talking about it in class. And especially in the first few cases when students are doing the presentations, we spend a lot of time saying, hey, this is what you should have said and actually looking at it as a group. The best part of that is the learning is not only happening between me and the presenting group, but it's also happening with the whole class. Formal evaluations have a lot more value. Uh, the student evaluations are actually one of the most interesting things because everybody knows they have to make the teacher happy. But if your goal is to communicate ideas to an audience, isn't it great to have the perspective of 10 or 15 people telling you what they saw in your presentation? And so that's one of the things that after each presentation, I take those things home, I mark them, and then I cut the names off the bottom and I hand them to the presenting group and say, here's the feedback on your presentation. And usually what I do to lighten the load is have about half the groups, uh, half the class involved in any presentation. So some folks get time off. The other thing that happens is when students don't understand, when you go through the example of one of the student presentations, it fosters a conversation. Well, what do you really mean? I mean, you'll hear a joke sometimes at our graduations. We didn't motivate the option space. That's one of my favorite lines in, in doing this rhetorical framework. And the point is, they can get clarification on, well, how would you have done that? And we can talk about examples, or we can take a group that did it really well and say, hey, that was great. Everybody do something like that, and we're in good shape. The other aspect of just having the real content there, several years ago, even if you don't use this technology, if you have presentations, I always make audio files of the presentations because there was a time when students said, we said that, and I was able to pull out my audio file and say, well, let's listen. Um, but that's just an aside. If you do a lot of presentations, you should always try and do something. Almost anything will work. iPhones actually work okay. Their batteries aren't real great. But like the little Philips iPod players that cost like 40 bucks at Costco, they have a recording microphone and they'll record like eight hours. And they're really small files, so they're easy to use. Some of the practical things ah, there we go, that I've learned about this. Uh, so far, I've been using Panopto because that's the one that's on the system. It has good days and it has quirky days. Uh, we've gotten th through most of the quirks. Um, but you just have to accept the fact that that's going to happen sometimes. Again, this idea of keeping the audio and video together 
The technology that's used to convert the voice to numbers and ones and zeros, they have different algorithms. And so video always gets compressed a little bit or expanded a little bit. And it's really hard to get the audio right on because it'll be right on at the beginning and off at the end. It, it, anyway, try and do it on the same device. Um, the other thing to do, this does take time. So what I like to do with these is I'll go home and I'll be preparing the written feedback and I'll run these jobs of creating the video files in the background. And just accept the fact that it's kind of a background activity, but you need to make, you need to set aside a block of time where you can sit there and every 20 minutes or so do something on your computer to go to the next file. They're also fairly resource intensive. So if you have a process, a, a computer with kind of medium capability, uh, recognize you're not going to be doing a lot of other things on your computer while this is happening. Uh, the other thing, uh, I think that having good video editing and rendering software is essential. Um, I have a couple examples that I'm going to just show you real quick of classroom footage so that you can see what some of this stuff looks like. Unfortunately, the student one has a glitch in it and I have no idea what it is. <laughs> I'll go home tonight and try and figure it out. But I have one at least of a class setting where I was doing a presentation for the students and you can see the kind of quality. Nero and Pinnacle on the PC is what I use. They're pretty easy to use. They're pretty quick. Um, I think uh, iMovie is adequate for the Mac. Uh, what is it? Final Cut is the fancy Mac version. That one's probably a little better. The other thing to remember, like I said, I have my little backpack. It has the tripod and everything else. And when there's a lot of presentations, there's a thermos of coffee and some monster in there and some snacks. Uh, have your own cables. And you also just have to plan for the fact that there's going to be days when you don't get content. On those days, I just get out my little audio recorder and make sure I have that part. But that will happen almost no matter, no matter where you are. Um, just some general takeaways. The first is this stuff is doable. I'm fairly technical, but the level that we've gotten it at at Pepperdine, it's accessible to anyone. Uh, the use of clickers, probably they have great online tutorials, but probably sitting down with Greg or, some, or myself or somebody else that's used these, you could have these up and running in an hour. Now, how you design your questions, how you rethink your content, that takes more time. But up front, these things are pretty standard. Uh, the university has made great strides in getting this stuff and simplifying it. Uh, and it's almost to the point, the other thing about this and this is the, the really great part. Um, Alan and Hong and all, I mean, the folks you, that are in this room here today, they'll come help you. You don't have to do this by yourself. Uh, they'll help you get the content together. They won't tell you what to say in your class, but they'll at least help you get your message and your ideas across. Although I suspect if you ask them, they might give you some pointers. Uh, uh, even with the cost and disruption, I've got to tell you that students really respond to this. Even the effort, even when things go badly, I, I, I had one day where the clickers just wouldn't work. I mean, there, the server was down at Turning Technologies, who are the guys that run the, the clickers, and they were disappointed. They're like, no, we want, our, we want our poll. And it's like, well, I'll give you the questions, and you can raise hands if you want. But you know, there's, you know, obviously you can't give a quiz when there's no evaluation. Uh, some practical things, some really important things about this. The teacher has to set the tone for this. When there are disruptions, you can't get frustrated because it'll carry over the students. And by the time that you're done, the students will say, well, that was a waste of time. The other part of it, and this is really important, we all work really hard to create constructive environments in our classrooms. With technology, the damage that one individual can do to a group is much greater. You have to work really hard to set ground rules that, are, that it's going to be a respectful environment that our conversations today are going to stay here. And in fact, I'd say one of the biggest fears for faculty, wow, I just created a digital version of my lecture. Somebody can post that sucker on YouTube. Guess what? My little iPhone, I could create a digital image of your lecture and post it on YouTube too. I mean, all, you're, all you're actually seeing now are the real threats that are there, if, that, if you consider that a threat. Um, students record classes all the time. I mean, those kinds of issues are there. But that's why the, the trust in the classroom, the, the culture of the, of the classroom is so critical. You just have to have an environment that the professor is creating. The other thing, I always go first. I'm gonna show you, um, actually let me switch over real quick and just show you this, um, one quick piece of video. 
when, when, we, when I talked about the critiquing the presentations and we talked to the students about, you know, maybe you shouldn't dance around so much or touch your face or flap your arms or whatever you're doing when we speak, the first day that we talk about that, I actually do a presentation of a case. And this is me doing that case, and I'm pacing back and forth. A negative factor for economic development. We brought a proposal to the FAA. You see me going back and forth, and just kind of like I'm doing today, flapping my arms at the board. All kinds of things that could be disruptive. But the point is, we do that as a group first. And the, you know, we talk about what the appropriate way is to provide feedback. We talk about how to, how to be constructive in our comments and how to be respectful of people. The other thing, and, and this is a challenge with technology, your students are going to text, they're going to do Facebook if they want to. I mean, even if you tell them no, some student will be sitting in the back of the room with their phone down under the table texting their friend. I, for a long time, thought, wow, I have to be a superstar performer to do that. One of the things that these kind of technological interactions do, one is it gets the student involved. Two is it takes that technology that was going to be a distraction and it at least makes them spend part of the bandwidth on the educational purpose that we're here for today. And so I see it as a really constructive kind of thing. The other thing to, to remember is student privacy is so critical. I've been wanting to do this forever. Pepperdine's had the capability of limiting access to class websites to the Pepperdine community. But guess what? That's not good enough. The classroom is a special space and we need to respect the privacy of that space so that the things that we're sharing and experiences are for us. And so, you know, we haven't been able to do this. That's part of why I'm so excited about this idea that we can do classrooms. Um, the other thing is that your daily class planning has to change. Your preparation's a little longer, but more importantly, if this is going to be an important part of the learning process, it can't be five or 10% of the grade. It has to be a larger share of the grade so students are serious about engaging it. If I give a quiz every day and it adds up to 5% of their grade, how worried are they about the quiz? They're not. But if I give a quiz every day and it's 20% or 25% of their grade, it becomes much more serious. And the rubrics that you use, there's a, there is a growing literature on how to assess these kinds of things and how to assign grades for it. It's something I've been doing for a long time and I'm just feeling confident that I kind of have it figured out. Uh, but it is one of the challenges of trying to teach that cognitive process as opposed to trying to teach just content. The other part, the modular class sections, I kind of joked earlier, 10 minutes is good because these things shut off after 10 minutes. Or, but the reality is you want to break it into smaller pieces. If nothing else, if you're building a platform to make sure that when you get to the next step on the platform, the, the foundation has been laid effectively. More formats for discussion. One of the great things about this, even in a big section with 50 students, is we're able to take these conversations that we initiate with the clickers and we're able to break into groups and continue those conversations and then bring those interactions back to a greater group. There's a lot of different group interaction formats in, that you can use in large settings like that. And the fun thing is you get to just kind of experiment and see which ones work with the group you have and which ones don't. Um, there are some cultural parameters. Um, you know, we've seen a rise in the number of students from Southeast Asia, for example, where interaction is a little more, is a different dynamic, and that's one of the things that we've worked actively, that's one of the things this technology really gives us leverage, because they feel like they're part of the conversation before it even starts. And it, I've seen a much higher participation rate because of that. Uh, the other thing, the technology overhead, it will take you 15 minutes to register all the clickers the first time. That's just reality. But that's 15 minutes well spent if it gives you a tool that you don't have to think about for the rest of the semester. The other cool thing about the clicker assessment, it's instantaneous. I don't have to grade 52 quizzes. I have the results from 52 quizzes. There's actually a button that we're in the process of turning on in, in courses that will let us upload that result into their quiz grade for that day. So I don't even have to, I, I want to make sure it's right, but I don't really have to touch it very much. The other thing is I was talking about before, the role of new assessment models. I've spent a little bit of time on this because I was kind of a first mover, but the places where we are at Pepperdine now with the support we have, it's not a huge learning curve. It's a very flat learning curve. I will point out technology is a tool to encourage personal interaction with course content. There's still going to be students who are disengaged. Uh, I'm not going to stand here and say this solved all of my problems. Uh, there's always those challenges. The best part about it, though, is that 
as you see this unfold and as you do it a couple times, you start to see ways that you can move the conversation in a path that gets where you want to end up in terms of how they get there as much as where they ended up in the dialogue. Instead of lectures, my goal in this particular class especially is that learning becomes more about the thinking, the analysis, the argumentation, the choices, and most importantly, at the end of the day, the values. Are the things we're doing, do they reflect what we want? And so, yeah, I appreciate this time. If you're watching this online, I appreciate the time you're taking to do that. Uh, I just, you know, as somebody who's been doing this for a while and starting to see some of this potential, they asked me if I would share something. And I thought about what are the useful things I'm doing with all the toys I'm playing with. And this really, to me, strikes me as the things that are transforming the way I teach the most. So thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take it. Thanks. In your syllabus, do you um, have a statement about respect? In do I have one about? Well, we have the honor code statement, and the, yeah, because I talk about this as a class that's about communication and interaction. And uh, the language I use specifically, I think, is uh, you know, this is a professional environment, and everybody's expected to adhere to professional standards in their interaction and their communications. And that this, you know, probably if I had to add anything to that, it would be this is a learning community and it's really about helping everybody develop. Um, if a professor wants to adopt, you mentioned that you, you don't have a formal textbook, but you're using the payment of the clickers as... Well, I, I, that's just how I rationalize it. The law school actually bought clickers for everybody. Um, and I would love it if public policy did that, but our budget's not quite as loose as... Uh, to some of the larger schools. Did you just work with the bookstore too? I, I've been doing it directly. I've been doing it online through the vendor. That is one of the logistics. That means the, the first version of your syllabus that students get should say, by the way, you need to go do this today. If you go with the software version, it's, a, it's an app. It downloads and you, you enter the code they give you and you have instant access. You can, the reason I went with the software version in part, I actually like the software version if it didn't do the timeout thing. Because it does take, you know, it's one thing to push a button on here and all of a sudden this thing is alive again. Here they actually have to log into the website and enter their password again. And so, but this one lets you have one word answers as opposed to just one through 10. And so the response where is better, it's cheaper, it's only 15 bucks for six months. Which, you know, if you have a semester class, that more than covers it. You can buy a four-year license for 50 bucks and a two-year license, I think, for 30 bucks or something like that. They do give us a, a discount because we do work with them, so you just need to contact their rep and tell them you're at Pepperdine, and they'll give you the magic code that your students use. Um, but, yeah, so I just, I assign this. I have students buy it. Again, some of the other schools have actually bought them. Uh, Could they sell them back or sell them on to... Well, they can certainly sell them to the entering class or to someone else. Um, I don't have a budget to buy. I actually thought it would be neat to kind of buy these back. Turns out only six students out of almost 60 actually bought the clickers. Almost all of them went to the iPad, the Android device. It was, it was half the price. It's economics at work. But they can't sell it off. They can't sell it off, but, it, well, and there was no guaranteed market to, to buy these back. It, it could be that we decide at some point that we want to have create a, you know, if we, I may require the clickers next year if I can't figure out how to get over the 10 minute thing. Um, and so if I do that, I'll probably look at some support somewhere to try and buy them back for 20 bucks and then sell them to the next cohort for 20 bucks or something. Well, because in economics, I think it will be very helpful, you know, like in the middle of class, I'm all the time telling them, you know, does this curve shift to the right or to the left? And then they, they scream out right, left, right? And sometimes they get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And they feel embarrassed, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, like in your case, like whenever, um, well, so we should talk about getting something in the department that can be used for other yeah. classes. Well, right? the Davenport Institute actually has some, but they actually use them. So okay. it's, you know, it would, be, it would be difficult to rely on it. Pete would be out of town and, and yeah. Bell or something like that with the clickers on the day he wanted to use them. But yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, because for me, I already use Athlea, so they are already a pain for right. something I'm using online. So asking for the clickers will be too much, I feel. Yeah. So, but it, it's definitely a, a great tool. For and and I, I didn't do it in my public finance class this semester because the textbook was like $170. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I really wish they weren't that expensive, but it's a great book. And what's 
they download it or buy it, they can use it for any class? Yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a single device. The one thing that you have to coordinate is which, if you're using the clickers, which frequency this is on, and it's a setting actually on the professor's menu. There's a separate application for the professor. And you just tell them what frequency to put in, and then they type it in here. And if they use this version, there's a code, a six-digit code that's assigned to that class. And you can actually request the same code for the whole semester if you want. And then they can just put in that code and connect to the class. And you say some questions are anonymous, and then some questions... You can tell it whether you want an anonymous question or whether you want it identified. Okay. And then what happens is when you get the report on the students, the ones that are identified, it has their answer and whether they got it right or wrong, if you tell it what's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And then on the ones that are anonymous, it just has a blank. It has a right. dash. It says, I'm not tracking that. Right. Can I ask, it's useful for polls. I also do polls in Sakai. Mm -hmm. So, but I need to do them ahead of time. And, uh, but they answer right away and then you can get a result there too, right? Yeah. You can have some fun with these too, right? You can every once in a while for some levity, you can put in something silly. On average, how many questions would you have per class? Um, this class I had in here was a typical one. Usually I have five or six assessment questions because that's kind of the maximum. It's a two-hour class, and that's kind of the limit I put on ideas that I'm really trying to reinforce. And so I try and make the questions for assessment around that. And then the other parts of the class, it depends on what the issue is and what the class is. For a strategy class, I mean, you saw probably there were 10 or 15 additional questions in this case clustered around four themes. And I use those at four different points. And my goal was to kind of provide examples of how you would build a strategy in the context of these four very different sets of issues. You know, peace in the Middle East versus uh, regulating banks and corporate pay, that kind of stuff. So. Just a small question. How does the whiteboard get integrated into the video? Is that through Panopto? That is actually a yeah, Panopto in the classrooms that are wired for it where they have the, the capture devices. They, you can record four threads, I think. There's video, audio, there's the whiteboard, and then there's the document reader. Okay. And if it's not wired to that, you have to, what do you have to communicate? Um, that I would defer to Alan on. I, I haven't merged them. I, I, I know PowerPoint, for example, has a feature where you can merge video into the slides and do the advanced points. It would be a fair amount of time. I mean, well, not a fair amount, but you'd have to go through your whole presentation in real time. So you, you have a two-hour class. It's two hours to map the slides if you have that many. Um, is there another way to do that? I don't know if Matterhorn or anything like that has that built into it. Well, there are a lot of tools we're, we're exploring. Uh, the communication division right now has been using Panopto heavily because they're, you know, in their speech classes, all the students are required to give speeches. So then that's just like you were using it for that same purpose, then they can go back and review themselves and then for the next speech they can improve upon how they interacted with the class, how they engage people with eye contact, all of that. Yeah. Um, but they're using a primarily video focus, not computer and video at the same time and other media. But yeah. you, you definitely have the ability to have your PowerPoint, have your, your video camera feed. Yeah. Panopto, and by the way, you don't have to have a classroom that's wired for it. There's a cart, right? right? That you can take around to the classrooms and use Panopto with the cart. So especially, you know, I, I suspect at Seaver there's probably you know, a lot of classrooms that aren't wired. You can actually use the cart. I don't know if they have the details yeah, in order to get it. Yeah, CCB but. for communication are their dedicated rooms because they have so many speech classes that they've just invested in dedicated equipment in those. But. Right. But they do have the cart, which does the same capture and, and the same upload. There's a app that you can just put on. If you have just a PC or Mac laptop, you can install the client. So, and you can just run the capture from your personal computer if you wanted to, and it just saves it. I've tried that. I think they're moving that speech lab uh, down to the library. So it would be near the ACE. Over the ACE Center. Yeah. Mm. Which opens on Friday. Um, the iTunes University, uh -huh. is that open for anyone at Pepperdine or only for the class or how is it? Well, there's different levels of authentication. If you, if you go into this, the, the website, the way you get to it, the library is managing this part of it because it's considered content. And so on their webpage, this is the library's webpage here, they have a link on the front of it that says iTunes University. And if you click on that link, 
you go down to the bottom here, there's three ways of logging into iTunes. One is the public, everybody in the world can see it. Another one is anybody at Pepperdine can see things. And then the third is restricted course materials. And so what happens is, if I click on the second one, it's only going to give me the things that I can see. So for example, my course would not show up if I clicked on the second one, and if, or if I clicked on the first one. But if I click on this third one, what you get is it spawns iTunes. And so give it a second. It's going to spawn iTunes, I promise. It's spawning iTunes. It hasn't spawned it yet. There it goes. And here's, here's the Pepperdine iTunes University page. And so what you have up on the top are sort of highlights and activities. Here's academics. This is political science and public policy is actually where public policy stuff is found. And then here's some other things from the university community, Pepperdine Life. So if I go in here, you will see school public policy stuff. Some of this stuff has been set up to be shown to the outside world. I'm not sure exactly which ones are which. But down here at the very bottom, are the ones that I have access to because of who I am. And so my course, Public Finance and Public Choice, is showing up on the bottom here because I'm on the list, and it's the list that's in PeopleSoft for the class. And so they populate those lists from the PeopleSoft rosters. What they'll ask you for if you contact the libraries is they will, and you say you want to do this, they'll ask you for the PeopleSoft course number, which you have to go into WaveNet and find, but it's, it's a four-digit number, and they will then use that to populate this list. And so there are there is some content the whole world can see, but only people who are on my course roster can get that icon at the bottom. And then if I click on it, and I probably should have done this as part of my presentation, I intended to, you get this window that shows you what's available. And you see the class lectures tab, and these are those you know two parts of the lecture on monopolies. And then there's this session tab that has a CNN clip. It has uh, the Albany Airport in two resolutions, because I was messing around with the resolutions. And then it has a student presentation, which I was going to show you as part of my presentation, but which refused to come up at the beginning of the session. And I have no idea where it refused to come up, but it refused. So I didn't use it. I just wonder, as with the Sakai, are you able to track how many people are accessing it to look at it again? I assume there's usage data built into iTunes but I don't know where it would be. If you look up here on the top, you can see how you manage the content. Like if I want to add files, that's the upload. Maybe in support or something, it might have some data. I'm sure the library, because they're the ones that are hosting this application, would probably have usage data if you wanted to see specifically who did. usage data is known as how many hits or how many downloads. Right. wouldn't necessarily right. say, you know, Joe Smith, so you can't tell that your student, the student that gave the presentation, went back to look at their presentation as we want them to do. No, there's no way. We'll ask the library if that's available, but I don't think so. I think the model is to be anonymous. And understand, this infrastructure is controlled by Apple. Apple controls what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do in here. And they're very, it's like the Apple, the App Store. They're very aggressive about what they allow. Uh, in fact, us doing this was a very big deal. We had to jump through a lot of hoops to get permission for them to create this kind of authentication access. And I'm, I think they're still unhappy about the problem. But, <laughs> but the, there's a lot of demand for it. Obviously, universities all over are saying, we want this for our classrooms. Anything else? Thank you, guys. Thank you again.